Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to Amsterdam to today's press briefing. My name is Marie Agnes Hein, and I'm the head of communications here at the European Medicines Agency. Today, this is a joint press briefing of the European Medicines Agency EMA and the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC. Therefore, I'm happy to welcome the heads of these two agencies who will brief you today. Dr. Andrea Amon, the director of ECDC, is joining us from Stockholm. And Ima Cook, the executive director of EMA, is joining me here in the room at, um, in Amsterdam. Our two speakers will provide you with the latest information on the spread of respiratory diseases in the EU, plus Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway, and will also update you on the vaccines and treatments currently authorized for use in the EU. The briefing will cover information on COVID-19, RSV, and seasonal flu. Today's briefing is broadcast via YouTube and Europe by satellite, and as always, you can use the footage free of charge. I'm now first handing over to Andrea Amon, the director of ECDC. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie Agnes, for the introduction and a warm welcome. Um, thank you for joining this press conference. We will soon see the arrival of autumn and uh, winter and where we anticipate the resurgence of uh, seasonal influenza and RSV. We are already seeing a, a small increase of um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission in the EU EEA and anticipate that all three viruses will co-circulate in the coming months. With this, there is a need to highlight um, the importance of uh, public health measures, uh, including vaccination, and to protect, um, uh, 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 to, to protect people's health. So uh, coming, starting with uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, in early September, increasing transmission of SARS-CoV-2 has reported, been reported by more than half of the EU EEA countries. Fortunately, the level um, of severe illness and deaths were still relatively low. In particular, it's important to keep uh, a close eye on COVID-19 in older age groups. And here we see that out of the 16 countries that report actually age-specific case counts, nine have seen the numbers rise in people 80 and above, and 12 of the 16 uh, see the numbers rise in people 65 and above. And these increases have lasted between one and eight weeks. The COVID-19 deaths uh, in absolute terms remain low compared to uh, levels reported earlier in the pandemic. However, four of the 12 countries with um, age-specific data have reported small uh, recent increases in death among people age 65 and above. Now, this increase in SARS-CoV-2 spread is likely contributed to by factors like um, uh, increased travel and large gatherings uh, during the summer month, as well as waning immunity uh, to infection following a long period of low virus circulation. Um, these observed increases uh, of SARS-CoV-2 transmission also coincide with the emergence and dominance of a group of Omicron-related sublineages that are referred to as XBB, 1.5-like variants, carrying a certain mutation. For, to be exact, it's called the F456L mutation. And in addition, a new Omicron uh, sublineage BA 2.86 was sporadically detected since August uh, within and outside the EU EEA. Although only a few cases have been confirmed uh, globally, uh, we can suspect since these cases occurred quite dispersed uh, that there is a low level community transmission in multiple countries. 
And this last variant is uh, quite uh, divergent from currently circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants, which could lead to increased reinfections. However, for now, there is absolutely no indication that infection with these variants can cause more severe illness or make vaccines less effective against severe disease when compared to uh, previously circulating variants. However, um, it still means that uh, older people and those with underlying uh, conditions are at a higher risk and um, uh, of severe outcomes if they get infected. So we see in parallel also an increase uh, in number of people going to their doctors with flu-like symptoms in many countries. However, this is still at comparable levels um, uh, uh, in, compared with, um, with the same period in the last year. So it's very challenging to predict uh, exactly when the circulation of respiratory viruses will increase or peak this winter. So nevertheless, the co-circulation of these viruses will put um, vulnerable people at increased risk uh, of severe illness and death, will put increased pressure on uh, hospitals and healthcare workers. So um, that is what we saw last year um, uh, or last winter, um, better uh, put. Influenza and RSV are also known to cause severe illness, particularly during the winter months, and especially among infants, young children, older people, and individuals with underlying conditions. So uh, we need to act now, despite uh, the uncertainties around when increases and if increases will occur, uh, we have to act now to minimize the burden on healthcare systems caused by the co-circulation of these respiratory viruses. And this can be done uh, through public health measures, um, including vaccination against uh, influenza and uh, COVID-19. And it is important that priority groups, uh, uh, groups get vaccinated uh, against these two diseases in line with the national recommendations and combined autumn campaigns uh, for these vaccinations should be considered. Uh, this approach would um, be more efficient in terms of administration, logistics and costs. So we should focus on people who are more at risk of having severe disease caused by influenza and COVID-19. That includes older individuals, people with weakened immune system and underlying conditions, irrespective of age, as well as those who are pregnant. Uh, our modeling has shown that an autumn COVID-19 campaign with a high uptake of the vaccine um, uh, that's targeting individuals age 60s and above could prevent an estimated 21 to 32 percent of all COVID-19 related hospitalizations across the EU EA until February 24. On the other hand, there are also personal protective measures uh, that uh, help us um, to keep uh, respiratory viruses at bay. And these are very simple, uh, but yet effective. Cleaning the hands uh, regularly, wearing well-fitted masks, in particular in healthcare settings or crowded closed settings with inadequate ventilation, um, especially in those areas where there is known to be a high circulation from respiratory viruses. And of course, staying home when having respiratory uh, symptoms. Um, and uh, it's important in order to know which are the areas the uh, um, high circulation of respiratory viruses that countries monitor not only SARS-CoV-2, but also influenza and RSV virus spread throughout the season and uh, how they affect people and the healthcare systems. Because reporting this to ECDC will help us to better understand the impact uh, of these co-circulating respiratory viruses and further strengthen our prevention and control guidance. The 
circulation uh, every season of respiratory viruses comes every year. It may be more or less severe. It may start earlier or later in the winter. We cannot afford to be complacent. Um, and by, by taking the necessary steps, we can actually prepare ourselves at the national and also at the EU level. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'm now handing over to Ima Cook, the Executive Director of EMA. Ima, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Maria Agnes. So good afternoon from me too, and a warm welcome to this press briefing. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today alongside my esteemed colleague, Dr. Andrea Amon. You've just heard from Andrea about the current epidemiological situation in Europe as we head into the autumn and winter seasons. And I think we have to acknowledge how much better prepared we are now than previously. European citizens have access to effective vaccines and treatments uh, to protect them from circulating respiratory viruses. So this is a good news story. And let me start with the new COVID-19 vaccines that, we have, that have recently been authorized. Uh, and then I'll touch on the armamentarium that we ha now have to protect us against the other respiratory viruses that you've just heard about. Uh, seasonal influenza and RSV. So let me start with COVID. For COVID-19, we now have two newly adapted mRNA vaccines that offer good protection against a wide range of the circulating strains of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. One of these is the commonality adapted vaccine, which was approved for use in August. And the other is the spike vax adapted vaccine, which was approved uh, uh, by the European Commission just last week. Both vaccines target one of the Omicron subvariants, the XBB 1.5, and they can be given to adults and chil children from six months old. Now, just let me explain a little bit about how we went about choosing the virus strain to be targeted. And this was based on the dominant strain that was circulating during late spring. Uh, uh, spring. It was XBB 1.5 at the time. Um, and we got together a group of international regulators to advise and ensure that we would have a global alignment on the approach to be taken during the fall uh, winter season. And although the current strains continue to evolve, the most recent data indicate that the two adapted vaccines also protect against the other currently circulating stra strains, including BA 2.86 that Andrea has just referred to. So as with all uh, vaccines that, uh, that we approve, um, the, uh, they have a, a, a very well-established uh, safety uh, profile, and the approvals were based on a thorough scientific evaluation of all the scientific evidence available, including a lot of evidence uh, available on, uh, on historic forms of the, of the, of the vaccine. Now, as for all vaccines, we will continue to closely monitor their safety and use. Um, and I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, what the other uh, existing uh, vaccines that that um, uh, are that are available. Because while the adapted version versions of Comirnaty and Spikefest spike vax best match the variants currently circulating, the previously authorized COVID-19 vaccines continue to be effective against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So the, all these options give member states the possibility to decide on what works best for them for their vaccination campaigns, taking into account the epidemiological situation and the vaccines that are available. So my message to you today, the pandemic may be over, but the threat of COVID-19 is still real. If you belong to a vulnerable group, you are at heightened risk of becoming severely 
ill. And so this is why we have together in a joint statement issued by our two agencies in June, we have recommended that if you're age 60 and above, if you have a weakened immune system and underlying health conditions, or if you are pregnant, you should get vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine. Now, let me briefly touch on the tools available to prevent other respiratory diseases. As regards RSV, again, we're in a much better position this year than we were last year. I'm happy to report very positive developments. Last autumn, we saw uh, large numbers of infections among the very young and the very old. And since then, we have two newly approved vaccines and also a medicine to protect against RSV. Now, both of the vaccines, RXV and Abrizo, are indicated for adults 60 years and older. But Abrizo can also be used by pregnant women, and it is the first vaccine designed to passively immunize infants from birth through to six months of age by vaccinating the mother during pregnancy. And this is particularly welcome news because RSV is a leading cause of hospitalization of young children in Europe. Already in October of last year, let me remind you, October of last year, uh, we authorized a monoclonal antibody, Bayfortis, that protects newborn newborns and children during their first RSV season. And this was authorized for use across Europe, and we see that some member states are already starting to use it. Finally, as regards seasonal influenza, uh, as like every year, in March we issued recommendations for the influenza virus strains that vaccines manufacturers should include in their vaccines for the prevention of influenza during the 2023-2024 season. This is based on a process and recommendations under the auspices of the World Health Organization that has been operational now for many decades. And all the corresponding vaccines have now been authorized and uh, will be rolled out according to the vaccination strategies uh, locally. I'm also pleased to support that the data we have uh, supports uh, co-administration of of the COVID-19 and influenza vaccines. And as Andrea has just said, administration of both uh, vaccines at the same time can be especially important to facilitate logistics, reduce costs and aid administration. Now, as I previously said, these options allow member states to make decisions on their national vaccination campaigns, depending on the epidemiological conditions and the availability of vaccines in their countries. Let me stress once more that COVID-19, influenza and RSV remain significant public health challenges. Together, we call on all people in the EU who belong to risk categories and who are vulnerable to please do take the vaccines that the public health authorities in the EU make available to you. Vaccine continues to be the most effective way to protect you from severe disease, hospitalization and death. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor back to Mary Agnes. Thank you very much, Ima, and we are now going to take questions from the floor. As always, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question and turn on your camera. And when I give you the floor, we will unmute your microphone and you can then ask your question. So we now have the first question from Angelo Di Mambro from Italian news agency ANSA. Angelo, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for the briefing. Um, in Italy, there is there is a, a mutation, a strain that is making headlines because the the increase in infections is 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 quite um, um, is quite important. It, it is the Eris EG.5 um, variant. Uh, can you confirm that also for this variant, or, or, or is there some reason of concern or? Uh, uh, because it seems that this variant is is um, uh, circumventing, let's say, the, the protection given from previous infection and from vaccines. What what could you can you say about this? Thanks. Thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, Ima, please. 
Thank you very much, Angelo. Uh, indeed, um, uh, this is one of the of the strains of the vaccines that we have, uh, the strains of the virus that we have been looking into. And I'm pleased to tell you that the newly approved adaptive vaccines um, also protect against the circulating strains, including ERIS or EG EG point five. Uh, this is one of the strains that, that uh, has been looked at in the context of these, these adapted vaccines. Thank you very much. We are now taking a question from uh, the Irish Times, Nomi O'Leary. Nomi, please go ahead. Can you speak up? We can't, can't hear you. I'll try to be louder. Just to clarify something, when you say that older people those who are pregnant and vulnerable people should take a vaccine. If they're vaccinated already, is that okay? Or are you talking about getting a new one, which is like a booster this autumn? What What do you mean by vaccinated? Thanks. I think also this question is for Ema. Ema, please. Yeah, so thank you very much, Naomi. And I think it's important that we clarify that. We are, we are talking about a new vaccination this autumn. Um, so in order to ensure that uh, uh, vulnerable uh, populations uh, maintain their protection against uh, um, uh, COVID-19 um, infections, we are recommending that uh, vulnerable uh, um, adults, uh, immunocompromised uh, um, people, uh, pregnant women should be vaccinated uh, this autumn. Thank you. And I think Andrea would like to compliment. Uh, Andrea, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Maria Agnes. You reiterate uh, or re-emphasize that uh, uh, regardless whether someone has been vaccinated or, or not, it's important to get a vaccine uh, if you are above 60, uh, have an uh, immune-compromised uh, uh, situation or other underlying conditions, regardless of your age uh, or, preg uh, or are pregnant. That's the advice. Thank you very much for this additional information. So I'm now taking a question uh, from Politico, from Helen Collis. Helen, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, two questions, if it's okay. Um, First of all, could you please give us an update on the um, any decision around the Novavax updated XBB 1.5 vaccine, um, if that's going to be um, a decision that comes in time for this season? Um, and then second of all, um, we were told frequently by the agency, um, by Marco Cavallari, who I see is on this call, um, throughout the pandemic, um, why it was so important to have a diverse portfolio of COVID vaccines um, using different technologies and different targets. I wanted to get an update from you on whether or not this is still um, a valid argument and, or whether things have moved forward from that, um, and if so, um, why? Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. And Ima is going to follow up on your question. Ima, for you. So thank you very much, Helen. And uh, we didn't include this because um, the Novavax is still under evaluation at the moment. But I'm pleased to update you that we did receive um, an application uh, for a monovalent uh, Novavax vaccine targeting the Omicron uh, XBB 1.5 subvariant. Uh, the evaluation started on the 24th of August. It's a protein-based uh, vaccine, and uh, it's targeted for uh, discussion at the October uh, CHMP. So all going well, we should have an outcome at that, um, uh, at that meeting. Uh, we also have an, a number of other vaccines uh, that uh, you may be aware of, and this comes back to the importance of having a portfolio of uh, different vaccines um, that really give the, uh, the opportunities for healthcare systems to choose or uh, uh, what works best in their own environment. Maybe also reminding you that we have, um, uh, in March of this year, we authorized the HIPRA vaccine as a booster. Um, and uh, this is um, uh, 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 
this, this, this is also going to be made available in, in some of the countries. So we're still continuing um, on the um, uh, uh, with with the challenge of of having a range of different uh, vaccines, uh, mRNA uh, protein based um, uh, that uh, 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 provide the European population with the greatest uh, um, choice and options that we can. Thank you very much, Ima. And I think uh, Ima responded to both your questions, Helen. So the next question is from uh, Maria Psara from Star TV. Maria, please go ahead. Oh, yes, thank you very much for the floor. Two questions, if I may. Could you please give us the state of play of the situation in the member states? I mean, uh, do the member states inform you about their data concerning the three vi viruses? or nobody wants to uh, discuss about COVID uh, anymore. And the second question, after many thoughts, people are even, even more reluctant uh, for a new vaccination. So do you see this advice of, of yours, an advice, an advice you said that you give uh, for everybody to be vaccinated, could be a recommendation or something more mandatory in the f near future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And I think, Andrea, you can respond to both questions. Uh, the first one was on the state of play in member states, whether you are still receiving the data, and the second one, whether perhaps a, a stronger uh, kind of uh, order to uh, do vaccinations would be preferred than only having recommendations. Andrea, over to you. Thank you very much, for, both for the questions and the floor. Um, yeah, we, the member states do give us their data, the data that I have reported on COVID, uh, that there is a slight increase, the data on increased visits to, to uh, doctors with flu-like symptoms come from the member states. So we do get the data. We have been working with colleagues in the member states on uh, integrating now the emergency COVID uh, surveillance with the um, uh, regular surveillance for influenza and um, uh, have recommended that these three viruses are monitored in parallel because it is important since we have now um, um, medication or vaccines uh, against all three that uh, uh, we know exactly which is the virus that is circulating because each, uh, of course, uh, vaccine and uh, medication work uh, effects only uh, uh, to the specific virus. So, yes, we, um, uh, we do get data, although we do uh, um, encourage our colleagues in member states to increase the um, uh, number of tests and um, uh, the, to, uh, have, we have given them um, uh, a, well, a protocol how to um, uh, do, for instance, testing in, in hospital settings for severe cases. Uh, regarding the reluctance, yes, it's true. Uh, the uh, uptake lately was not um, um, uh, very, very high. And this is what I mean. Uh, it uh, requires now campaigns specifically explaining the situation and uh, the risk, especially for these uh, specific groups that we have now frequently mentioned, the above 60s, the uh, people with underlying conditions or uh, uh, pregnant women. Uh, because I think um, in a situation where we are, where we have um, um, not a broad uh, willingness to, to, to get vaccinated, it's more important to focus the efforts on those that have the greatest risk. And that, I think, is what the campaigns should, should do. Thank you very much, Andrea. We now have a, a question from Swedish Radio, uh, which we received in the chat from Sarah Hyman. And, um, she would like to know, let me see, what is the first question here? Do you have any forecast or prognosis of how severe the influenza season will be? And this is also for you, Andrea. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
unfortunately, we have never been very good in forecasting how severe the influenza season will be. Um, we know the virus since more than 100 years and it still uh, can surprise us. So um, that is why I think it is so important to really closely monitor what uh, what the developments are uh, to monitor where the virus is circulating, what, the, uh, what the, the, the genetic makeup is, so that we can really see early on whether, the, for instance, there is a good fit with the vaccine uh, that has been given and whether there is, for instance, um, uh, a change that affects other groups than what we have uh, so far been, uh, been uh, targeting. Thank you very much. And now I think we have the last question for today from Mose Appelblatt from the Brussels Time. Over to you, Mose. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear uh, you well. Please go ahead. Okay, fine. Uh, about the timing of the vaccinations against the COVID and the influenza. Uh, say, if you are a person which uh, took your vaccine against COVID, some time ago, the last boost storm, should one then, assuming that these new vaccines, um, which were recently adopted, if they are now available in the member states, uh, have been rolled out, I hope, should one prioritize that and take that as soon as possible and not wait for, let's say, for the campaign or for the co-vaccination, co-administration, as we talked about before, with influenza? Uh, because I suppose that, uh, I mean, uh, the influenza season has not really started, so maybe uh, that can be taken later, uh, while the Im immediate say, danger is perhaps uh, to become infected again uh, by COVID. What is your opinion about that? Thank you very much, Mose. And this is a question for Andrea, and I hand over to you, Andrea. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, the timing is, um, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why we're doing this press conference now is that uh, now is uh, sort of the, the, the overall um, uh, period starting. When it's uh, concretely the best uh, period in each country is actually really determined by the, by the epidemiological situation in the countries. And I think there, again, I come back to what I said before, it's so important to monitor very closely um, to uh, uh, catch the, 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 um, the increases early on and uh, do the measures early on. The vaccines, uh, as soon as they are available, they can be given. Of course, I mean, there is no, no um, uh, compelling reason other than what I said, the logistics and the uh, um, uh, reduction of cost that you give these vaccines at separate occasions if the epidemiological situation uh, uh, requires that. But I think that is something that has to, has to um, uh, be determined uh, after an analysis of the local local context and epidemiological situation in each country. Thank you very much. And I also hand over to Ima, who is going to compliment. Uh, in fact, uh, really just to say that uh, one of the messages is that we what we have what we advise gives options to the to countries depending on uh, the situation in that country. So um, the the vaccines have been authorized. Um, there is the possibility of co-administration with with uh, um, influenza um, vaccine as well. But really what works best from a country will be determined within that country itself. Thank you very much, Imer. And I do not see any more hands. That brings us to the end of today's press briefing. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. And I also want to thank today's speakers for sharing the updates with you and for responding to your questions. If you have any additional questions, please, please do not hesitate to contact and follow up with the press offices of any of the two agencies. So many thanks again and goodbye.